started. Welcome everybody to Pre-Health Shadowing. Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-led nonprofit organization focused on making um, flexible and accessible opportunities for students throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so we are hosting our first uh, pharmacist today. So it's really exciting. Thank you all for joining us. Pre-Health Shadowing has the um, ability to connect students from not only parts of the US, but all over the world. So go ahead and drop in the chat where you're Zooming from today. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Great. Just a couple housekeeping things before we begin. Uh, we do send out emails at the beginning of the week with all of the speakers for that week, as well as um, links to register for their session, as well as the Zoom ID. If you are interested in getting those emails, this is how you do it. Uh, Prehealthshadowing.com slash join us. This will put you on our email list. Once you do that, you're gonna wanna go into your email, uh, mark our emails as important, and also save Prehealth Shadowing as a contact. If you do those things, it'll make sure that it bypasses the spam, the junk, and the promotions folder. We also do send out some exclusive opportunities. So Prehealth Shadowing as a student-led nonprofit um, gets uh, some really awesome deals with companies so that we can offer you guys scholarships, free opportunities. So always be on the lookout for that. We do send those by email as well, but don't worry, we don't spam. <laughs> And an update that we now have um, live captions for all of our um, sessions to accommodate students with hearing disabilities. As part of pre-health shadowing, making flexible and accessible opportunities, we want to ensure that students with all abilities are able to achieve their professional career goals. Pre-health shadowing has partnered with the women-led organization Mask for Mask that for every four masks purchased, four masks get donated to um, a person in need, whether it be a hospital that is lacking in resources or the homeless community or anybody who does not have the resources during this global pandemic. They have already sent out over 40,000 masks in the past four months. And so you guys can get 15% off your purchase. They have some really cute designs. Um, if you use the code PHS15 at checkout, be sure to check out their website, maskformask.com. And you guys can also support pre-health shadowing on the way because 10% of all proceeds will be donated to pre-health shadowing to help us keep our website up and free for all of you. We also partnered with Fem Health, who is holding the Fem Health Purpose Summit, which is a year-long subscription to listen in and gain insight from 19 founders, CEOs, and leaders in healthcare. Um, one of the um, leaders that she was telling me about uh, is a multi-million dollar CEO and was on Shark Tank. So if you guys want to kind of network and collaborate, um, gain some insight from some very um, inspiring and successful women, uh, definitely sign up for this. You can find details on our Instagram, check our link tree for our affiliate link, and you can sign Sign up with pre-health shadowing. This is a really cool one. If you guys are, anybody's getting ready for the MCAT, Kaplan is giving us some free study guides. All you have to do is put in your email and you will be signed up with pre-health shadowing to get um, free study guides. You will also have 10% um, coupon code off of a bunch of different free, um, or Kaplan courses. Also, we will be holding a scholarship contest uh, for a $2,500 um, course scholarship. So if you guys are interested, you can check out our link. If anybody is interested in getting published, you can now do so on the official Pre-Health Shadowing website. You can send in articles, reflections, reviews, and success stories to be reviewed by our editor-in-chief. You can do this by sending in your submission to prehealthshadowing.com slash blog hyphen submissions. You can only do this by typing it in the URL. This is not accessible through our main menu. So if you're interested, I do recommend writing it down really quickly or taking a picture of the URL. I'll leave it up for a couple more seconds. Oh, now it just got covered. <laughs> there it is. Alrighty. Pre-Health Shadowing is starting a student podcast. If you are interested in joining the team, uh, you can sign up using the link in the chat. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for you to work on a project that you're passionate about, you know, spreading the word, keeping people informed, um, and collaborating with students all across not only the US, but the world. So it's really great. 
I do welcome you guys now to pull out your phone uh, and to scan this QR code. This is going to take you to a page on our website called the donate page. Uh, and we do uh, and welcome you guys and encourage you guys to uh, donate any money that you can. We are a student led nonprofit organization and run solely off of the contributions and support from our community. We are working to fight inequity in health education and to promote diversity in the various fields. And so we have vowed to keep our shadowing sessions completely free for anyone who has access to our website across the world. Please help us in um, joining this movement by donating. Uh, we really appreciate any contributions that you're willing able to make. If you uh, are financially unable to donate at this time, we completely understand. All that we ask is that you please share this link with someone who you do think will be able to donate and that will really help us out. We have been having some major website crashes and we want to ensure that students who are, you know, working, trying to put in their grind, you know, doing their shadowing hours are being able to um, really take the post shadowing assessment and um, get their verified hours. And so please help us by keeping this alive and we appreciate anything that you guys can do. Alrighty, if you guys are looking for a mentor, Free Health Shadowing has virtual mentorship opportunities for you guys with established healthcare professionals in your field of interest. Networking weekend on the weekend of February 19 to 21. You have the opportunity to meet with up to six established professionals and connect with like-minded students and potentially get your mentor for life. This is by uh, invite only. So if you guys are interested in gaining an invitation to this event, this is what you do. You can click the link that was just sent in the chat. You can also download the materials from our Google Drive, register as a volunteer on our website, post those three images on your social media. We also recommend putting a little personal like video of you or um, your own little message. And once you have your bingo board all filled up, you submit it to the pre-call shadowing website and then you will gain an invitation RSVP to your mentorship networking weekend. So it's that easy. Um, and if you guys are able to, you know, spread the word on this for anyone else who is interested, they're more than welcome to join. The submission box will close on January 31st. So at the end of the month, you guys do have about um, a few days left. So if you guys are interested, I Definitely recommend hopping on this. Some ways that you guys can get more donors is by sending it out individually to people um, and sending a personable message. If you are interested in helping out, Pre-Health Shadowing has volunteer opportunities and team member opportunities. You can check out our website for more information. If you are a high schooler and you would like to join Pre-Health Shadowing on the student team, we do have opportunities for that as well. You can sign up on our general team member application and just indicate that you're interested in HTP. This will be working to establish Pre-Health Shadowing as a club on multiple campuses across US high schools. Um, and so kind of showing people all of the different um, healthcare careers that are out there. If you are joining us today for our live sessions, go ahead and post pre hall shadowing on your social media for an opportunity to get reposted on our official page. Don't forget to tag at pre health shadowing. With pre health shadowing, students can take an assessment to receive a certificate that verifies their virtual shadowing hours with us today. So I do recommend that you take good notes and ask our professionals some great questions. Throughout the entirety of today's um, session, feel free to drop any questions or comments in the chat, and we will be sure to ask them during the Q&A portion. Without further ado, I would like to welcome to you our very first pharmacist. Welcome, Dr. Larison. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to see this crowd here today. Um, hopefully you have lots of great questions since I am the first pharmacist speaking to you all. Um, hope to provide some really valuable insights and educate you on some opportunities in the pharmacy field. So um, feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A and we can um, discuss them after. So I will go ahead and start sharing my slides. Sorry, it's like not coming up now. No worries, should we start off with our first oh, poll? I got it. Okay. I got it, sorry. Okay, okay. them now? Okay, perfect. Okay. 
So I'll just start out giving you all a little introduction to myself. So I am a doctor of pharmacy. I graduated with my degree in May of 2020 from the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. I took a little more non traditional pharmacy path after I graduated. So I'm pursuing a postdoctoral pharmaceutical industry fellowship through the Rutgers program. I'm currently working in global medical information and oncology. So I'll talk a little bit more later on in the presentation on what that exactly is and what I do um, on a daily basis and kind of what um, I hope to do after the fellowship as well. But this presentation is more just to give you an overview of the opportunities that pharmacists have and kind of how you get um, to those opportunities as well. So I do have to just throw this little disclaimer in here. Um, the opinions expressed in this presentation and on the following slides are solely of myself and not of Rutgers or my company Merck. Rutgers and Merck do not guarantee the accuracy or reliability of this information. So we'll start out with just why pharmacy and why um, you should consider pursuing this path. So early on, I would say probably in undergrad, maybe even in high school, I started thinking about what career I wanted to pursue um, in college and after that. And I knew I always had an interest in science and math and excelled in those classes. So I knew a lot of people are saying you should go into the medical field. That's what everyone says. As you know, you have to take a lot of chemistry and um, organic and biology classes. So if you do good in high school, then you should go that route. Um, and I actually did have interest in healthcare, but I really didn't like being as hands-on with patients. I know a lot of you are probably pre-med route, so you like kudos to you because I hate blood. Um, on some of my pharmacy rotations, I actually went um, and shadowed some surgeries and fainted in one of them. So I really knew like the hands-on um, direct patient care route wasn't for me. So I think pharmacy gives you a great opportunity to still be involved with the care of patients, um, helping manage their medications, and even pharmacists are expanding um, their roles within the healthcare field. I mean, we can start vaccinating patients. Um, in some states, you have the opportunity to do um, like flu testing, strep testing, based on um, what your state allows. But really, the um, opportunities for pharmacy are expanding so much. So as I mentioned, in pharmacy, you can have direct or indirect patient care. So direct patient care, that's like if you're working in a hospital and you're rounding with a healthcare team and seeing patients directly and counseling them on their medications. Whereas in the pharmaceutical industry, I'm working in a more indirect patient care setting. So I don't work directly with patients um, pretty much at all, but the work I'm doing every day is impacting them at, on a larger scale. So that's what I was really passionate about is reaching more patients um, really on a global scale versus day-to-day -day type of interactions. Next, um, the wide variety of career opportunities. So most of you all, when you think of pharmacists, you're probably thinking of your pharmacist at Walgreens or Rite Aid, CVS, the retail pharmacist. Um, I feel like that's what most people think pharmacists do, which that's not wrong, but there are so many more opportunities for pharmacists out there besides working in retail um, and just counting pills, but they do a lot more than that. Um, so really, once you go into pharmacy, uh, the career opportunities really do not end with just retail. You can work in hospital and industry um, in managed care, and I will go through some of those on the next slide as well. So, the other thing with pharmacy, I think if you are thinking to kind of like your skill set and what, uh, why it might be a good fit for you, I like to say that pharmacists are very type A, um, whether that's good or bad, but they are very detail oriented professionals. So if you like um, being very detail oriented, organized, paying close attention to details, I think a pharmacy could be a good fit for you because you are having to check prescriptions and medications and paying really close detail to, is this the right drug for the patient? Does this interact? Is it the right strength? Um, things like that, even over to the industry side when you're doing medical review, 
and materials, you're having to pay really close attention to the data in them as well. And then just being innovated. I think this can go into really any career field, but especially in healthcare, you're wanting to come up with the most innovative ways to provide patients um, healthcare. Also with developing drugs, you wanna be innovative in that way also. And then the um, job mobility, stability, and flexibility. So I know people are starting to say pharmacy is getting very saturated. Should I still go to pharmacy school? Um, so I really think it depends on the area that you're wanting to go in. I don't think the um, pharmaceutical um, career path is saturated at all. Uh, yes, there are more pharmacy schools popping up, but that doesn't mean the um, quality of pharmacists that are graduating from them are um, top quality. So it really depends where you wanna go after you graduate with your PharmD. Um, so the other thing with mobility, if, if you do graduate and you go into hospital pharmacy, you can stay in there for 10 plus years and you decide, I don't really like this anymore. I want to switch to another area. That's completely fine and actually really well accepted. So in the pharmaceutical industry, we really value the clinical experience that pharmacists have working in those settings. So a lot of times people will switch over from hospital to industry later on or vice versa. So I think it really, um, once you go into a certain career or if you specialize in something, you're really not stuck there your entire career, which I think really makes it exciting to be able to change and challenge yourself throughout your whole career. Um, and then um, with the stability part of it, uh, so they are saying pharmacy is getting saturated, but I really think it depends what area you want to go into. So yes, retail, that is the easiest route to go because right when you graduate with your PharmD, you can get a job in retail. So that's kind of your fastest way to start making um, good money. But um, that is with it being said, with it being easier to get into, that's where a lot of people have been going. But I think if you do post um, doctoral training, like in a residency or fellowship, it really gives you a specialized set of skills that really markets you and sets you apart from other pharmacists. So I think once you do additional training in a residency or fellowship, it really does set you apart. And I don't think you would ever have an issue with not finding a career because unfortunately people are always gonna be sick. They're always gonna need medication. So they're gonna need a pharmacist. Um, so I really uh, think it is a very stable career. And then lastly, it is a very highly respected and trusted um, professional. So if you think about it, it if you're sick and you go to the pharmacy to pick up some over-the-counter medications, you can go straight up to the pharmacist at the counter and ask for their recommendations. Um, it's harder to have access to Did our professional drop out? I think um, her screen froze. Okay, no worries. Um, so am I back? Yes. Oh, okay. there we go. There we go. I don't know what happened. I'm so sorry. It just like went off. Okay. Um, can you not see my slides anymore? No, we can't. Can you? Um, okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, you're all good. Thank there you. you go. Okay, I don't know why it just like disconnected. So sorry about that. Okay. okay, so I think the last part I was saying was just basically pharmacists are um, highly respected and trusted even by other healthcare professionals. They know that they're the medical experts. So they really do value the pharmacist's opinions when it comes down to um, the patient's care and prescribing a medication for them. So next, I'm going to talk about the career opportunities in pharmacy. So as I mentioned, you can work in hospital. So this, you can go straight into hospital as well, um, staffing. So that's just checking the medications that are being um, administered to patients, making sure they're the right dose, the right strength for the right indication. And then you can specialize in hospital as well. So if you wanna go into a certain field, you can do um, only oncology. It could even be to a certain um, 
cancer type as well. If you want to go into like cardiovascular surgery, emergency medicine, there's so many areas. So you can really specialize in hospital as well. And then retail is what we kind of talked about earlier. So um, retail pharmacists are very valuable as well and work very hard. I worked in retail as an intern for about six years and I just knew it wasn't the right um, fit for me, but they work very hard um, and long hours. So I think retail pharmacists are awesome if you can do that. Um, and then industry. So that is where I work, um, as I mentioned earlier, more indirect patient care. So this is really where the drug goes from clinical development to the patient. You are, um, there's so many different functional areas within industry, and we'll talk about those on the next few slides later. But it is really the opportunity where you collaborate with other individuals in so many settings to provide a larger impact on patients' lives. And then ambulatory care is kind of like in an outpatient clinic where pharmacists are in a specialized clinic. So this could be like diabetes, um, anticoagulation clinic. So for like warfarin monitoring and patients come in and they would get like their INR tested by the pharmacist and then the pharmacist can adjust their medications. Same thing with diabetes. If um, they need their diabetes medications and insulin adjusted, these are just an outpatient setting um, that pharmacists can work in and provide patient care. And then veterinarian pharmacy is another area. So if you really like animals and also like medications and drugs and want to combine them together, I think it is another great um, career field in pharmacy because our pets need medication too, especially um, larger animals. So like the equine business, uh, they really need a lot of medications for horses, especially in the racehorse industry. And then lastly, managed care. So this is um, kind of on the payer side of things. So working for uh, an insurance company like Anthem or Humana, and they're really helping bring evidence-based medicine, um, the use of it, and applying that to their patient populations that are on their plans, helping them optimize their medications at the best that they can with their healthcare resources. So next, I'll talk about kind of the journey to applying to pharmacy school, um, some tips, and this can really apply to any professional um, like doctorate program. I know a lot of people are pre-med, um, interested in nursing school, dental school, um, PA school, so this really can apply to any of that, but these are more um, that personally I had experience in. So always, I think, acquiring leadership experience. I think that is so important because to build your career, um, you really need to develop those leadership skills. So just joining an organization and pushing yourself to take on leadership roles in organizations, I think is great. And especially with what this organization is doing now, I think I really can see a lot of leadership skills and attributions in them. So I definitely recommend staying involved with this organization. And then um, pharmacy schools have pre-pharmacy clubs. So I'm sure uh, med schools have the same thing. And so these are really great to join because they kind of walk you through the application process to pharmacy school and what's required. So for pharmacy school, we had to take the PCAT and it was a terrible exam, just like any other standardized test. So you have to know um, if, if you need to take that, when you need to take it by, um, do you have to write, do you have to get letters of recommendation? Do you have to write an essay? It really provides you all the details and the timeline of applying to these programs. And then next, I would recommend gaining pharmacy experience or just experience in the field that you're interested in to really make sure this is what you wanna do because pharmacy school and med school is a lot of time and a lot of money and you don't wanna get in like halfway through and know like it's not the right fit for you um, because it is a lot of sacrifices of um, at least pharmacy school. I did three years of undergrad and four years of pharmacy school. So it is um, a long time and even longer for med school to start going into that and then realize you don't like it. And I think it just helps you know kind of what area you want to go into. So for pharmacy, you can get a pharmacy technician job even before pharmacy school and work in a retail pharmacy. That's what I did. Um, and I think it even 
and helps build your CV, just showing you have work experience in the healthcare field. And I'd even recommend that to people that are interested in like PA school and medical um, school, because I think just having that pharmacy background and getting used to the drug names and what they do, because I always hear um, med students or PA students saying like pharmacology is their worst class and so hard because it's like so many drugs in like one or two semesters. So you never know, working at a pharmacy could really help you. Um, and then just shadowing. So exactly what this organization is doing, um, getting shadowing opportunities to see if that is something you're interested in and in pursuing as a career. Next, I think it's always good to start building your CV or resume, whatever is required for that application process. Um, because you really, when you wait last minute to apply to something and you start from scratch on your CV, it's really hard to think about all the experiences you've had from like high school and undergrad and things you've been involved in when those have happened like over two or three, four years or more. So I always recommend starting a list. So on my computer, I use OneNote and I try to do it weekly, monthly, really if I do any big projects, presentations involved in planning of like events, I will write it on my OneNote and then, excuse me, when I have time later on, I'll add it to my CV so I don't forget those important things that I've done throughout the years of my fellowship or in pharmacy school. And always having people like proofread um, your CV, I think is really great too. And I think that's kind of like your first, everyone's first impression of you when you are applying to a school or um, a job, you really need to have a strong CV. So it's never too early to start working on it now. And then preparing for interviews. So for pharmacy school, we had multiple um, mini round interviews. So they were like eight minutes long. You had a prompt, you went in, and not even all of them were medical related. Some of them were random things. It was more just to see how you think like critically about a situation, how um, you can communicate. So I think just starting to practice for interviews is always good because you'll have to interview um, many times throughout your life for after pharmacy school, medical school, if you do a residency and then to your career later on. So I think really gaining that confidence for your interviews is really important as well. Um, so I think Nina, we can go ahead and do the first um, two polling questions if you wanna pull those up. Oh, okay, we already answered this one. Great job. Oh, wait, okay, sorry. And then you can do the second one. Okay, and okay, now we can move on to the next slide. Thank you for your participation. Yeah, the results. <laughs> oh, thanks. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the postgraduate training options that you have after you get your pharmacy degree. So one of the most common um, postgraduate training op opportunities for pharmacists is the residency path. And so this is more for the direct patient care if you're wanting to work in a hospital and specialize in a certain area. So you can do um, what's called a PGY-1. And so that is a general residency. So it's usually just at like an advanced hospital and you're rotating through various areas within um, pharmacy. So you're not specialized yet, you're just general. And then the second year, um, if you decide to specialize in a certain area like oncology per se, you would apply for a second year residency. And so that would be focused only in um, that specialized area that you're pursuing. And then after that, it really helps you um, to get like board certified in that area and move up um, and have more expertise um, and be focused in just um, a certain area. Uh, fellowship is another option. And so that is what I'm completing. It is an indirect 
patient care um, fellowship. And so with residency and fellowship, they say the two years of training in these is like expedited training of um, three to five years. So it really helps you gain a lot of experience and it is very time demanding, but it really helps you gain those experiences early on in your career so you can move up um, further a lot quicker. So with fellowship, the nice thing, you only have to interview for a fellowship once. So they have one and two year fellowships and I'll talk about more detail of the fellowships um, on the next couple slides, but you have a one-time kind of interview process and they can be in um, a very certain like functional area and therapeutic area, which I will speak to on um, the next few slides. And then manage care residency, so this is managed care, as I had mentioned before, working more on the payer side and making sure that patients are provided the most out of their healthcare benefits based on evidence-based medicine. And uh, these residencies can be one or two years as well. And so a fellowship is what I'm gonna focus on next. So as I mentioned, these can be one or two years of postgraduate training. My fellowship I'm currently completing is two years. I think it is hard deciding on should I pursue a one or two year because there's pros and cons to both. A one year fellowship is nice because you think, oh, it's just one year. I can get out and start making money a lot quicker. But really, you only get to do a fellowship once. And I feel like one year would be so fast, like I wouldn't be ready to go into a full-time position because honestly, you would have to be applying for your career six months through your fellowship. Um, so I really didn't want to cut any of my opportunities and experiences short. So that's why I chose the two-year. And your fellowship is completed with a partner pharmaceutical company. So I am um, completing my fellowship with Merck through the Rutgers program. They are partnered with over 20 pharmaceutical companies and um, they can be academic affiliated or a standalone fellowship where mine is with Rutgers. So it is academic affiliated. Um, I think there's pros and cons to both of those. I'm personally for an academic affiliated one. I think there's a lot of benefit to it. I have the opportunity to do teaching with the university as well. And there's a lot of professional development opportunities. You have a lot larger network of other um, pharmacists and fellows in the program. So I think it really provides you um, a great learning opportunity um, with academic affiliated versus standalone would just be an independent company um, having their own like fellowship program, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Kind of is just personal preference. And then they are in a therapeutic area of interest. So um, whatever company, um, they're, the drug they're making, if it's treating diabetes, then obviously you would be focused on diabetes for your entire fellowship. Whereas uh, my fellowship is in oncology. So I'm focused on oncology in both uh, years of my fellowship. So next, I'm gonna talk a little bit more and describe to you what the pharmaceutical industry is because I'm sure a lot of people don't really understand what you do in the pharmaceutical industry. And I will also mention, um, even though this is more geared to pharmacy, um, this presentation, the pharmaceutical industry career opportunities extend past pharmacists. So I work with uh, people with their PhDs. I work with MDs. So even if you do go to medical school, this could be a route for you later on if you are wanting to go into patient care. So I actually work with an oncologist he worked in oncology for many years and now he came to Merck and is on our team. So they really value all uh, medical professionals, nurses as well. Um, just any medical degree, I think is really valuable. Um, so just keep that in mind when I am talking about these various areas. So um, the pharmaceutical company is broken up into functional areas and kind of where you fit in and they all work together um, to really bring everything to the patient. So regulatory affairs is works closely with um, the FDA in regulating all the medications, the drugs, making sure um, they are abiding by all the regulatory standards um, that are safe and effective for patients. 
drug safety. So this is obviously dealing with kind of uh, the safety pharmacovigilance of medications, uh, monitoring the post-marketing safety of drugs, and if there's any adverse reactions reported, it's going to drug safety, and then they're um, feeding that back into the company and then into clinical development um, to go into further studies um, on the drugs. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, clinical development um, is working closely with the uh, clinical trials. So that can be monitoring clinical trials, designing clinical trials, really working closely with the data and the design of clinical trials. So if you really like um, data and the science of developing clinical trials, um, I think that's a great area um, to go into. Um, health economics and out comes research. So this is <clears throat> looking at um, more the getting drugs to payers and marketers for uh, patients, really getting them access to the drugs um, that they need. And then medical affairs kind of works at the center of a pharmaceutical company. They communicate and work very closely with honestly all of these areas. So they um, work probably most closely, at least I do, with marketing and regulatory affairs. So they're bringing um, the clinical lens to the pharmaceutical company. Um, with that being said, there's still medical people in all of these areas, but it's really um, you're able to see it with a medical lens, what's gonna be the best for the patient? How is this actually used in the real world for patients? Um, and then marketing. So marketing is kind of the creation of how to market products. So the commercials, um, ads that you see on Facebook or social media. So they are really creating, if you have a creative side, um, I think marketing is really a cool area as well. It's a very fast paced environment, but I still think it's very beneficial to have that medical background in marketing because a lot of stuff that does come from marketing goes has to go through medical. And most of the time medical does not approve of it um, based on like the data and science that it needs to align with. So I think if you had more medical people um, in marketing, it really could streamline the process even smoother. Um, I think we can do, okay, we can do the next polling questions. Alrighty, go ahead and answer the poll if you have not submitted your answer yet. I'm going to be closing it and showing it. Alrighty. Okay, and then you can do the last one now too. Thank you. Okay, so now I'll kind of speak to you a little bit more, like after you know about the functional areas, what kind of helps you make that decision on which area you should pursue? So obviously first, I think learning more about that area. I knew early on I wanted to go into medical affairs when I learned about some of the um, roles and career um, positions that they had in medical affairs. So I really researched that functional area and learned more about um, what they do, what they look for in um, medical professionals. And I think it's also really important in industry to start building your network. So highly recommend if you don't already, um, start your LinkedIn, especially now with COVID and having to do everything virtual. It's really important to start building um, a network. So making sure your LinkedIn looks professional, making sure to have um, a photo of you, a bio, um, and really engaging with the people that you connect with. Don't just connect with people um, to connect with them, uh, be intentional about it, see if they 
work in a certain area that you're interested in, reach out to them, um, start a conversation with them. I think that's so important um, to learn early on and you don't know where those connections will take you. And then I think um, really consider just your personality, your skill set, and your preferences. Like what really fits you? Um, where can you benefit from, like long term, with your career development? And then what um, field do you feel like can benefit from you um, as well? So I have a very outgoing personality. I like to communicate and engage with people a lot, but I like um, a very fast paced environment that's stimulating and constantly changing. I don't like the same day-to-day -day repetitive um, activity. So that's why I really felt <clears throat> like industry was a great fit for me. Um, and then I really like the science side. So medical affairs still stays really close to the science. And then lastly, I would just recommend gaining experience in one or more functional areas. Um, if you can, especially in pharmacy school, I know you can do um, rotations during your fourth year in the pharmaceutical industry, um, but they do have other opportunities like internships um, that um, other professions can look into to gain that experience really before you decide to pursue it fully. And so next I will touch on more what I do in my role in oncology global medical affairs so as I'd mentioned, I went into industry because I wanted a very stimulating environment. I don't like doing the same thing over and over. I, I like routine, but I get bored with it easily. So the industry really is a stimulating environment. You have things that are constantly changing, constantly coming up, um, especially with drug development. There's always um, new drugs in the pipeline and coming out. So I knew I wanted a career like that. And it's hard to say what my day-to-day -day, um, activities are because they really change every day, but I'll kind of break it down more by week. Um, so my Tuesdays and Thursdays are pretty meeting heavy. So I may be in meetings from nine to five on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then maybe on Wednesdays, I have like half a day full of meetings and Mondays and Fridays are really those days to like prepare for the week and then wrap up for the week. So Mondays is a lot of like admin stuff, like catching up on emails, working on my projects um, for the week and preparing for meetings. And then Friday really helps me like wrap up everything and then get a head start for the next week. So I don't have um, kind of the same day-to-day -day routine um, per se. <clears throat> And then um, probably my main role um, in medical information is medical review of promotional material. So <clears throat> this is um, kind of hard to understand because I didn't fully understand it until I started um, and I'm still learning more about it. So when I say promotional materials, I mean like a commercial you may see on TV for a drug. So that has to go through a very thorough review process. <clears throat> so the commercials are made from the marketing team, the functional area I'd mentioned earlier, and they have to go through a review meeting. So those are my meetings that are on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, it's a meeting with the marketing team, uh, the medical affairs team, and the regulatory team. So I review, say for example, there was a commercial. I had to review it before the meeting. So I'm looking <clears throat> for this at this commercial with a medical lens, making sure everything in the commercial is truthful, not misleading, not out of context, that everything is balanced. Because if a doctor or a patient sees this commercial on TV and they see all the efficacy and this can cure this or this can treat this, but there's no safety, there's no adverse effects, um, that's illegal. That's not okay by the FDA because you have to have everything balanced out. Um, the doctors have to be aware of the side effects that a medication can have um, and really have that data to support it. So from the medical lens, you're really thinking of the safety of the patient. You don't want um, something to get approved and get to a doctor and they see it, but they don't necessarily see the side effects or risk to it and they prescribe it to their patient. Um, a company could really be in a lot of legal trouble. So being able to have that safety lens for the patient and knowing the data 
data, knowing the clinical trials to really support and back up those claims is really important. And um, there's regulatory that sits in these meetings as well. So they are kind of, we're overseeing the medical part and then they're just making sure that um, what is being said is okay in regards to the FDA. And then another part of my role is responding to medical information requests. So these usually come from physicians or doctors in the field. Um, they may be treating a patient and this patient develops a condition or has a pre-existing condition and they wanna see the data that we have on treating patients with this condition with our drug. Um, so we can send them the data that we have on that. Um, we've been giving a lot of questions on the COVID vaccine, like. Uh, can we use the COVID vaccine with this drug per se? So it's really just, it's not providing medical advice because we can't do that. We haven't seen the patient, but it's just providing them with um, the data and information to make the most um, clinically and um, safest um, recommendations for their patients. And then lastly, I... Um, being with an academic affiliated fellowship, we have professional development days. So these are once a month and right now with COVID they're virtual, but we have about 300 fellows in our program and we all get on Zoom and um, we have different guest speakers. So we've had uh, people come in that um, are helping you build your leadership skills and personal development, as well as um, educating you on health literacy and just really different topics every time. We um, will take turns giving presentations during these. So it's really just a great way to meet other fellows and then learn from other professionals in the field and their experience. So now um, with that being said, I've finished all of my slides so we can go into the questions that you have now. Awesome, so our co-host Aster is going to be asking you the questions orally. Aster, are you ready to go? Yeah, I am. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was really informative. I think there's a lot of great information in it. So one of our first questions is, are there specializations in the pharmaceutical skill sets that are different based on what pharmaceutical field you want to pursue? Like, for example, with someone who wants to go into the industrial pharmaceutical industry, need more experience in chemistry than in other fields. Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, your PharmD can get you to any of those. And I think it's more your extracurricular experiences, um, as well as like skill sets that you develop. So in industry, um, communication skills is probably number one, um, being able to communicate really well because you are communicating a lot of data um, and translating that in meetings um, to doctors as well. So I think it's more um, the soft skills because once you have the PharmD, you, on, you can learn anything. Once you go through pharmacy school or medical school, you have that clinical background. So it's more the skills that are pertinent to um, that role, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you. That does give insight into people who are, you know, when they're, when they're pursuing their um, undergraduate degrees, like what yeah. classes and courses might be applicable to them. So our next question is, is postgraduate training necessary to get a job? Yeah, that's a great question. So no, um, it's definitely not uh, required. And even you can get into industry directly um, without doing a fellowship. So there are entry level positions in industry, um, but the fellowship or residency really provides you uh, more expedited and it is a very extensive um, path, but it helps you kind of move up quicker. So if you are wanting to specialize and get to a certain position, it um, allows you to do that within two years versus like four or five per se, if you went um, directly in a different route. Um, so it's more, what is your end goal with uh, what position you're wanting to be in and um, 
what you're kind of like willing to do if you want to do a fellowship or residency because you do get a significant pay cut it's not a nice like pharmacist salary yet um, but it is worth um, just the experience and uh, continuing education you are getting thank you okay our next question is how is drug safety and regulatory regulatory affairs different can you go a little more in depth about that yeah, so I'm not um, a specialist in either of those areas, so I haven't had as much interaction with drug safety as regulatory affairs. Um, so regulatory affairs is kind of like the FDA and the safety net of a pharmaceutical company. So pharmaceutical company can get in trouble if they really don't provide all the data um, and really follow all the regulations. I mean, they have so many regulations in place for um, the safety of drugs, even other things like over-the-counter medicine, devices, um, cosmetics, those things. So they really have all these regulations. So regulatory is the rule followers. So they're making sure that the drug um, through the clinical development process, through the marketing process, once it gets to the patient that all of those rules that the FDA has in place are being followed from a legal standpoint so you don't get in trouble. So drug safety more kind of like analyzes um, and follows the safety um, of a drug. So even after post-market, so that's when a drug goes through the clinical de development phases, they get to market. Um, safety still watching that drug because some people you don't know could develop longer term um, side effects that don't show up that maybe um, weren't during the clinical trial, but later on. So safety is regulating to that and then putting it back into their clinical trials. So even though a drug is approved, you still may be doing more clinical trials on it. Like say um, a certain populations of patients develop a side effect or adverse reaction from this drug, then safety can analyze that and then put that into clinical development to put more studies um, in that area to learn more information on potentially that adverse reaction. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> No, it does. It sounds like the regulatory affairs is more of the administrative side, and then the um, and the drug safety is more of the scientific. Like, let's put that back into, yeah, <laughs> back into the people's hands who can fix the problem and identify it. Okay, so um, our next question is: What is the hardest part of pharmacy school in your experience? And do you have any advice for students beginning pharmacy school? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, all of pharmacy school is hard. Um, it gets easier. First year, I would say, is definitely the hardest just because it is a huge transition from undergrad. The material you are learning is a lot harder and in depth. Um, I know we had more kind of like basic, more sciencey classes first year of pharmacy school, but then when you really got to learning the disease states, not as much like mechanism action stuff, it really got easier um, and more interesting to learn about. But I would say really just the first year is learning how to study because in pharmacy school, you have to study a completely different way than you've ever studied in your life because this is material that you have to like keep in your brain like forever, like at least to graduate pharmacy school and to pass your boards. So it's really a lot of um, material that you're building upon. So you can't just like take a test and then like dump that. It really builds upon it. So I think just staying on top of um, studying and your notes. So it's really good to, after your classes, like at night, spend like an hour just rereading your notes or rewriting your notes um, and trying to study, just trying to stay on top of all the material because it does become pretty overwhelming at first. But when you know, like figure out what works best for you, like I really liked studying in small group settings. That really helped me knowing how much time I needed to study. Like you can't procrastinate and cram in pharmacy school, you definitely need to start like weeks in advance um, to be able to retain everything. So I think just learning how to study and knowing um, what methods work for you. And you'll figure that out. Like it's different for every person, um, but just really trying to go into it with a plan, I think it will help you. And that, um, uh, in addition to that, um, what, was, what did you find most interesting in pharmacy school? Like what was your favorite classes or courses? 
So this is actually kind of funny. This is not my favorite class, but I really did not like oncology, which that's where I ended up and I'm in now. Um, oncology is really hard. It was um, a very challenging and difficult course. Um, it wasn't until I had um, an oncology rotation that I fell in love with it and just the impact that you can have on patients' lives because there isn't a cure for cancer. So it is a really like innovative, fast moving area because everyone's working to try to find um, drugs that are going to improve patients' lives with cancer or extend their lives. So um, I found that to be like very rewarding after the fact, but I didn't like it in pharmacy school. Um, I really enjoyed psychology actually. Uh, that was like one of my favorite classes. If I didn't go into like industry and oncology, I would have liked um, psych. I think that's a really interesting area. And then I always really enjoyed lab. So like making compounding, like compounding medications, um, working with standardized patients. Cause I really just like enjoyed talking with people. Um, I really didn't like doing the vaccines or like flu testing and strep testing. I don't like that hands-on stuff, but the other stuff was really fun. Thank you. Um, because you talk so much about how these connections with people are important. How do you suggest that students are able to like foster that now, especially during COVID and when things are forced to be virtual? Do you have any specific advice or things that maybe you've learned while you're doing your fellowship and how to connect with other people? Yeah, that's a great um, question. I think really important no matter what field you're going into. So like I said, I think LinkedIn's a great place to start to build connections, but it's not just like connecting with someone, like a connection on LinkedIn. It is trying to build a relationship and building that mentorship. So like, um, I know this organization is starting a mentorship program. So I definitely recommend getting involved in that. Find professionals that are kind of like your um, goal person, like where you want to end up and really learn from them and stay connected with them. So once you reach out to someone um, on LinkedIn, everyone is always very willing to give back, at least in pharmacy and industry. It's hard to get to where we've gotten. So we really want to give back and help other people. So most of the time, if you reach out to anyone, they're going to be willing to like set up a call with you or um, like a Zoom chat, something like that. And then it's not just like a one-time thing. You have to continually invest in that to develop, develop that relationship and find a mentor. Like there's been a lot of students I helped with the fellowship process and applying for fellowships, um, but it was from like built relationships over a year or two. So just like check in quarterly once you develop a relationship with someone and kind of update them on um, your life and what's going on and how things are going. And I think that will kind of help you fall into finding a good mentor. Thank you. Um, kind of going along with that, what tips do you have for like boosting LinkedIn pages or um, how to like professionally reach out to people with and get a response? Yeah, I think that's a great question as well. So first, making your LinkedIn look professional. Okay, so having at least a photo, a nice photo of yourself, um, not saying go out and get like professional photos taken and stuff for your LinkedIn profile picture, but at least like something professional, like probably wouldn't make it the same as like your um, Facebook, like profile picture or whatever. Um, so having that, having a bio, like stating I'm an undergrad student, like pursuing pre-med, I am involved in this, like these are my career goals, these are my strengths, um, putting your accomplishments on LinkedIn. So really creating a professional page, showing what um, you're interested in and what your kind of goals are. I have a LinkedIn, if you wanna connect with me, I have like a little bio and you can kind of see that as an example. But then I think just when reaching out, to someone um, just telling them kind of like, oh, I saw that you work as this, as your role. I'm really interested in that as a potential career for myself. I'd love to talk to you and learn more about what you do. Like it can be something as simple as that. Um, and most of the time people are gonna be like very willing um, if they have time to give back and talk with you. Great, thank you. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about industry and elaborate on what that entails? Yeah, um, so it is very confusing 
um, for a lot of people. Um, I think a lot of my family still doesn't know what I do. They're like, um, what do you do? Um, but industry is ultimately, like I showed all those functional areas working together. So a pharmaceutical company develops a drug potentially for a certain therapeutic area um, to treat, cure a patient. So there's so many facets of that um, that come together to help uh, patients ultimately get a drug um, for a certain condition. So industry, as I mentioned in those functional areas, um, they employ so many different um, backgrounds from healthcare providers to um, like people with their MBAs, uh, people in marketing. So it really is all these different backgrounds collaborating, coming together, ultimately um, to provide a drug to a patient is kind of a big overview. But if there's certain areas within the industry that you're wanting me to elaborate more on, um, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that was a pretty good general like description of everything. Um, let's see. Okay. Is there any major personal failures you have faced along your path? If so, what were they? If that's too personal, you don't have to give a specific example, but can you talk about how you learned from them? Yes, this is a great one and something I really encourage. So looking back, honestly, I think I learned way more from the failures and grew as a person more from failures than I have my successes. So one of them thinking back, so in pharmacy school, your fourth year is all rotational based. So we have different rotations every six weeks. And for me going into industry, it was so important to me to get an industry rotation and to get that experience because fellowship is very competitive. And once you have that experience, it really kind of like helps you get a your foot in the door. So I had applied to um, the one fellowship program. So I went to a very clinical focus school. They don't talk about industry at all. It's all very like clinical residency focused. So everything I did, I kind of had to um, research on my own, but they did have one industry rotation um, <clears throat> partnered with our school. So I applied for it. I was the president of the industry pharmacist organization. So I really went into it thinking like, oh, I should get this rotation. Um, like I just thought it was gonna happen. Well, I didn't get the rotation and I was like so devastated. But I had also applied to some other rotations as well outside of what the school had because I wanted as much exposure and experience as possible. So even though I was really upset, I didn't get the one that was with the school, I actually got accepted for um, an industry rotation <clears throat> that was in New Jersey and I got to go there and complete it. And so because of that experience, I really don't think I would have um, pushed myself as hard to become a Rutgers fellow. Um, it was kind of always a dream of mine, but it was it's a really big program and I didn't have that experience. But since I had, um, push myself and got um, that other industry rotation. It helped me get my foot in the door and gain that experience, as well as I was able to go back to my school and kind of create like a new opportunity for other future students interested in industry that they now could apply to another industry program outside of the school. Um, so it really, I think, helped provide other students more um, opportunities, but also taught me um, don't give up like on what your end goal is, because honestly, the rotation that I um, ended up getting, I think was way better than the one that I was like really wanting um, and taught me and provided me a lot more experiences and opportunities. I think that's great. It's nice to know there's an example of something that maybe it doesn't go as planned, but there's still definitely a good solid path to getting to your goals. And especially now during COVID, I mean, I think everyone's been thrown off their track a little bit, but thank you for that insight. Um, is there anything you recommend that we do as undergraduates to build experience? What did you do specifically? Yeah, I think it's really important to get involved. So I think first, just getting a job, if you can get it um, in healthcare, I think that looks good. Um, but that just shows kind of your responsibility. 
um, your discipline to get experience? Because I know once you get into med school and pharmacy school, it is harder to have um, a really steady career, like part-time. I mean, I don't mean work full-time and go to school. Like, I mean, just part-time, like a few hours in the evenings and weekends, potentially at a pharmacy or um, like a clinic or something like that, I think is really important. But getting involved in like health organizations. So <clears throat> there was a student wellness ambassadors organization at my university. Um, so I got really involved in that. And I think it provided me um, just a good opportunity because it was focused around like health and wellness. Um, and I could relate that to pharmacy school. And I really helped um, set up events and have guest speakers. So I think just getting involved in anything that is like healthcare related that you can relate back to whatever your ultimate like in career goal is um, or like pharmacy school, med school, how it can relate to that I think is really important. Okay, thank you. Um, also, by the way, to any students, if you would like to ask your question directly, feel free to use the raise hand function and we can get to you. Um, our next question is, what should students do to um, build their confidence and kind of and their um, academic strength in applying to schools like this. Talk a little bit about extracurriculars to boost applications, but what specific advice would you give for academic success? Yeah, um, well, that's something you will always have to work on. I will say going from pharmacy school to a fellowship, definitely I'm working on the whole confidence thing right now and telling myself I am qualified to be doing this because it is a lot different going from a student to a pharmacist. You're not used to be the being the decision maker and having like the final say and um, really being a key contributor as a pharmacist. Um, so I don't think that necessarily ever ends, but pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, if you're comfortable, you're not going to grow. Um, so doing sorry, my computer's like starting to die. Um, doing the things that are gonna make you uncomfortable is how you're going to kind of overcome those fears and gain the confidence. So starting to practice like interviewing skills with um, a friend, like family member, brother, sister, mom, dad, whatever, start practicing like interviewing with people. Um, I think that really helps build um, confidence and kind of preparing that. Um, with, with academics, I think just like studying hard, um, if you're not making the grades that you want, like asking for help, getting tutors, um, really trying to do everything to get like your academics up to where you want them to be. I mean, I wasn't a 4.0 straight A student. Um, I made above average grades, obviously to get into pharmacy school, School, but I think a lot of things that go further, like long term, is the experiences you have. I think if you're looking at two people on paper and there's one person with a 4.0 and then one person with like a 3.7, with all these experiences, that's really going to benefit and be able to apply in a future career. I think that's a lot more beneficial than someone um, that just studies hard. And I mean, they may be really smart, but they might not have had like real life experiences and know how to handle those in um, like real situations that you may have um, in your career. So I think just getting those other experiences and pushing yourself out there um, will help you with that. Thank you. Um, so Tim gears, is the debt to pay ratio solid for coming out of farm pharmacy school? Um, so it kind of depends. I had some partial scholarships for pharmacy school. Uh, so it really helped me not have as much student loans. And I am doing a fellowship. So that fellowship residency salary, I would say, is probably a third of what you're ultimately going to make as a pharmacist. So you do have to take a small pay cut for a little bit, um, but it ultimately makes up like after that because your pay can go a lot higher than if you just go straight into a position, you're kind of like stuck there. Um, so it kind of depends like if you have scholarships, if you have money saved up for college, but if you're, so say you're going out of state, so that pharmacy school is gonna be a lot more expensive. Um, you're 
taking out loans for all of that. Um, then you do like residency or fellowship and then you're like kind of waiting. So it really kind of depends on your situation. I mean, pharmacy school is expensive, but there are like scholarships you can get if you go in state, um, it may be cheaper. And then, but I think ultimately like it's gonna be worth it that you start out at a really good salary. So as long as you are smart with like paying back your loans and your finances after, um, I mean, you should be able to pay them back um, in a fairly quickly amount of time. Thank you. On a related note, what is the highest paying like specialty or niche in pharmacy? Um, I don't know particularly the highest paying. I'm sure like there's no like ceiling really for certain specialties. And I think um, the nice thing though about industry, it, you can really like move up a lot. Um, so I would just say starting pharmacist salary, like maybe at a basic, um, not specialized area, maybe would be like around 120. And then depending on like where you go after that, and depending on the geographical location, what area you're in, maybe up to like 160, 180 um, from what I've like heard, but I don't know a ceiling, but I, I really don't think there, it, it just depends on the area probably you go into. Like if you're going into retail, you are either like a staff pharmacist or um, a pharmacy manager. And so that would probably have a more definite like ceiling of probably like 130, 140 versus um, in industry, you have a lot more room to move up or in hospital, if you're specializing, you can move up with salary as well. Thank you. Um, someone is wondering, do you have any tips for getting ready for the PCAT? So I'm sure it's changed a lot since I took um, the PCAT, um, but I purchased, I think it was actually the Kaplan books for the PCAT as well and did like the online videos. So I recently took my board exams and not that the boards are equivalent to the PCAT, but I just think any type of standardized testing, it's more just like creating um, a study schedule um, and see like trying to get through all this stuff, knowing what works for you, using note cards, practice exams are everything. So definitely do the practice exams, um, that will help you. But I would, will say, I know some pharmacy schools are not requiring the PCAT anymore. Um, so make sure you look into that before you like start studying and purchase the PCAT because I know it's expensive. Um, some school, like I think it's about 50-50 um, right now where some are still requiring it and some aren't. Um, but definitely practice exams, going through like a book um, that really just like helps guide you. But I will say I actually took the PCAT twice. So the first time I did not do that well, I'm not a good standardized test taker. Um, but then I took it again and like increased my score so much um, and automatically got like an interview into pharmacy school. So there's another failure, <laughs> but definitely um, paid off in the end. Sorry, thank you. Um, somebody's wondering, did you take a gap year? Or would you recommend um, it? So I did not. Um, pharmacy, <clears throat> some pharmacy schools are actually unique in the fact that you don't have to have a full undergraduate degree to start pharmacy school. So you can ultimately do all your pharmacy prerequisite classes and then start pharmacy school school so you can either do like two years of undergrad I did three you can do two to three I really didn't want to cram everything into two years so I did three years and then went straight into pharmacy school um, so I did ultimately seven years and I just personally wanted to be done um, like in that amount of time um, but I do know people that have so I'm actually marrying a pharmacist and he did his full four years of undergrad, graduated with his degree in nutrition. He took a gap year and worked um, at a retail pharmacy as a pharmacy tech, um, made some money, 
um, learned m more about pharmacy to make sure it was what he wanted to do and then went to pharmacy school. So I really don't, I mean, I haven't had experience doing it, but I know that's what he did. And I mean, I think he was happy with it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but it just kind of depends. You can either take that shorter route if you don't mind like not having an undergraduate degree and just wanting to like get on to pharmacy school or if you're wanting more time. So I think it's more um, what you feel like is a better fit for yourself. Thank you. Um, you mentioned you graduated in 2020. So how did COVID kind of affect your experience and how did you in school and how do you compare the two, like virtual and then in person? Yeah. Um, so actually I was in my rotations. So fourth year in pharmacy school is all rotation. So you're not in the classroom at all, like learning. So the first three years is all classroom based and then the fourth year is rotations. So I didn't have to do any like online courses. So I never had that um, affect me necessarily per se. Um, but my rotations, I'm trying to remember. I think, honestly, I still went in because I was on a VA rotation um, in like acute care. So I still went into rotation every day. I know like a majority of my class did not. Um, their rotations let them stay from home, but for some reason I still had to go in every day. Um, but I did not get a graduation, which was very upsetting. Um, I know it affected a lot of people as well. So we didn't have a graduation or anything. So that um, definitely affected us. But ultimately at the end of the day, I got my, um, fellowship that I was really excited about. I still got my diploma. I still passed my board. So I'm still the same, just didn't walk across the stage um, and get a really expensive piece of paper. <laughs> but um, I, it didn't impact my classes as much. I know now they were doing some online learning and they're back, I think, in classes now and just social distancing. Thank you. Um, what is your favorite part of the fellowship that you are in right now? Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. Cause there's so many things I love about it. Um, honestly, probably just the challenge because there's new stuff I'm learning every day. I think diving deep into the oncology therapeutic area, learning the clinical trials behind them. Um, and really seeing the data and seeing how many people um, a drug can really touch and help um, their, um, like change their lives. But I think just the challenge of, I, I'm a goal person. So I set goals for myself and I really work hard to try to achieve those no matter what. So I think trying um, to take on new projects, trying um, to taking on different, their, um, different like cancer types and uh, learning about them. So I would say um, just the learning aspect and the opportunities, like everyone's so friendly. And if you're wanting to see something or be exposed to something, they provide you the opportunity. Thank you. Um, okay, this is going to be our last question. So just from your experience in pharmacy school and then in your fellowship now, how did things carry over? How would you compare the two and the relevance of your learning experiences? And then any final advice you have? Yeah, um, that's a really good question as well. So it's hard because you aren't taught like industry classes or anything really about industry um, in pharmacy school. I know if you do go to like Rutgers, they have um, more industry focused courses, which I think more class or more schools should do because really in pharmacy school, we maybe had like one or two classes about clinical trials, which I think is important to know, but that just like touches on what you should know in industry. So it was more through those industry rotations or internships where you really learn um, what to take over. But with that being said, I think the clinical knowledge and that background is really important in industry and knowing how it relates to the patient, knowing the disease state and the background. 
And then just those transferable skills. Um, so like critical thinking, time management, um, collaborating with others, the leadership skills, um, being able to be very well spoken, your written skills, um, writing, if you're writing response letters to doctors. So I think just other skills that you develop um, can help transition for the fellowship. Um, and then just any last um, words of advice I have is really just this is your time to figure out what you want to do and where you fit best. So do a lot of like self-reflecting. I took so many like online like quizzes and seeing like what my strengths and weaknesses were. So really um, reflect on what your goals are and where you feel like you would be the best fit. And just remember that you are going to learn um, and grow so much more from your failures than your successes. So don't be afraid to fail. It's going to take you so much further in life. And honestly, you're going to need something to talk about in an interview one day. Um, it's boring if you don't have anything that you've grown, the, grown from or gone through um, to talk about. So don't give up on what goals you have. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was such an honor to have you. For all of my students, stick around um, for information for how to take the post-shadowing assessment to get your certificate for joining us today. Um, we're gonna just take a moment. Um, this is uh, some reflection questions uh, that we ask you guys to answer. You guys don't have to turn this in to prove that you were here or anything, but these are kind of just for you to hold with you as you begin applying to these various programs. Um, this is really gonna help you when you're writing your personal statement. So um, just some things to think about. If you are interested in um, putting these on our official website and submitting these, you can get published with Pre-Health Shadowing. You can submit your reflection from today's session on our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions and um, feel free to also if you're interested looking at articles reviews or success stories um, so yeah if you are interested in joining our student team in a leadership role this is a 100 remote opportunity for you to meet with like-minded students um, do some professional outreach gain some connections as well as um, kind of gaining skills in a field that you might not have had the opportunity uh, to do so in in another situation. So this is really um, a wonderful opportunity. We have over 30 team members um, from across not only the US but the world um, joining us on our journey. Um, of course, this is a time commitment and we understand as pre-health students, we don't always have the time to commit. Um, so if you are interested in getting involved but don't have the time, we do have volunteer opportunities, um, both asynchronous and hands-on. So if you guys are interested in any of that, um, you can sign up on our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash medical shadowing slash volunteer. We do humbly ask you today to help us keep virtual shadowing free for all students everywhere. Um, we have provided free virtual shadowing opportunities to, accessible to anybody in the world. Um, and we are working to fight against inequities in health education and promote diversity in the various fields. This is a link to join our fundraising team where you can actually get certified virtual volunteering hours for helping us out. So if you are interested in gaining some easy hours, um, be sure to register as a volunteer on our website complete the volunteer training and get started. Like we talked about during the session today, gaining a mentor is crucial, especially as we are in this global pandemic. If you are interested in gaining a virtual mentor with pre-health shadowing, you can join us for our mentorship networking weekend, which is taking place the weekend of February 19 to 21. It's a three day event when you have the opportunity to meet with up to six established professionals um, and also gain connections with like-minded students who may be on the same path as you. So this is by invite only if you are interested in gaining an invitation to this event. Um, you can find some more information on our website, but this is literally all you do. You're gonna download three pictures from our Google Drive. You're gonna register as a volunteer on our website, post these photos on your social media. Once your bingo board is all filled up, you will gain an RSVP link for our event. Please note that this will close on January 31st. So if you have not started yet, I do recommend sending it out individually. Uh, you're more likely to get responses. Um, be sure to tag us in your social media posts at Prehealth Shadowing and use the hashtag Prehealth Shadowing whenever you do anything cool. We would love to hear about it. You can get reposted on our official account on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 
We have some upcoming shadowing sessions to end off this week. Um, you can register on our website for these virtual shadowing sessions as well as take the post shadowing assessment. And finally, to get your certificate that verifies your virtual shadowing hours today, you are going to go to our website and find our guest professional um, speaker profile page. Once you do so, you can click free, take this course, and you will have 30 minutes and two tries to get over a 70% on the post shadowing assessment. Once you do so, you're going to click finish course, and you can download your certificate certificate immediately and you can also view it at all times in your profile under the certificates tab. If you guys have any questions or experience any difficulties feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you again Dr. Larison. it was an honor to have you. This is the end of the virtual shadowing session and I invite all of my students to disconnect from the call. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much.